Um, Dr. Lau and Dr. Meta, thank you for two excellent presentations. And in some ways, they really are complementary heart health and uh, you know keeping the rest of our life healthy. So uh, we have lots of great questions for both of you. I would encourage all of you in the audience, please do continue to type in questions uh, live, and we will take as many as we have time for. We have about 15 minutes. So uh, I think I will begin with you, uh, Dr. Lau. Uh, Questions on the calcium test to assess women's heart risk. Absolutely. Um, I'm here with, can you all hear me okay? So I think we're, I'm here at the Vincent Center with. I'm so sorry, everyone. I did just want to let you know that we have a wonderful group of about 60 women all enjoying this presentation together. Uh, at the Vincent in Boston, and Emily, uh, Dr. Lau kindly agreed to be live with them. So if you hear some noise in the background, uh, it is not Emily's dog or her kids. It's a wonderful <laughs> gathering of women who are all, I think, really interested in the questions we have today. So, uh, Emily, would you please address that question about the uh, calcium test? Absolutely. So the question um, for our audience here is, what is the role of calcium testing in women for heart disease risk? And um, I think it's an excellent test, particularly for women who are healthy and do not have any pre-existing cardiovascular disease. I use it as a way to help risk stratify my patients. And what I mean by that is if I have somebody who's otherwise quite healthy, um, but maybe ha has um, abnormal cholesterol levels, a little bit of high blood pressure, I might use a calcium score as a way to better help me identify whether or not I should be thinking about putting my female patient on either a cholesterol medication or blood pressure medication. Um, so these are tests that we do not get in individuals who have cardiovascular disease. It's really a screening tool, but a really great tool that we have. Perfect. A question for you, Dr. Meta, and this one kind of fits in a little bit with Dr. Lau's talk. What about the Mediterranean diet? I mean, you did talk about the importance of nutrition. Is there a particular diet you recommend? Um, the Mediterranean one is often considered really heart healthy. What are your thoughts on that particular diet? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, ultimately the principles around a healthy diet include uh, really a, a, a diet that is rich in um, fruits and vegetables, a variety of fruits and vegetables that is low uh, in animal-based uh, products, uh, particularly red meats, um, and then, but but also, you know, high rich in in sort of the the healthy fats that particularly come from um, uh, from the fatty fish like salmon and others. A diet that is rich in nuts um, and um, and really minimizing sort of unhealthy substances like sweetened beverages and and such and refined sugars and. And, and really having a whole grains. Uh, so I think those principles have historically and continue to be true. They're universal across all cultures. Uh, we don't really see that that much, but in the ways in which those are actually um, uh, come up, you know, in actual practice is obviously uh, culturally and ethnically specific in different traditions. But I think those principles continue to be true. And I think particularly there's often question around soy consumption uh, especially in middle for women. And I think there is no clear evidence that increased soy consumption, I think there's probably an epigenetic um, um, association that certain people perhaps respond to greater soy consumption at this and certain others don't. And I don't know if we have a really clear cut answer at this point as to soy consumption at this particular stage in life. Uh, thanks so much, Arshan. And for you, Emily, there were several questions on cholesterol. So one of the questions, I'll kind of combine them and, and let you just uh, answer them kind of together. One was, um, has the protocol for giving cholesterol medications changed in the last few years? So I assume they mean, you know, are there different side effects with newer medications? And then a question about how much does family history play a role? And then the other question was, you know, how important is the overall high cholesterol level if the HDL and LDL are favorable. So I thought those all went together a bit. That's wonderful. Um, so oops, it looks like we are a little bit delayed here at the Vincent Center. So maybe I'll ask if um, we could turn down the volume here and I'll repeat the questions for the Vincent Center for folks. So the question that was posed was related to cholesterol. So the first question was, do we, um, are there new protocols for thinking about cholesterol? And right now, in general, when we think about um, the, we're going to try to turn down the volume, apologies. 
just everything you say is so important, Emily, we get to hear it twice. That's right, that's right. Well, so the, so the question related to new protocols for cholesterol medication. So we in general use a cholesterol risk calculator to help us determine whether or not a patient should be on a cholesterol medication. Now, I think we're recognizing that these risk calculators are good for certain individuals, but often they underestimate risk in women. And they also uh, really give us a sense of what one person's 10-year risk of heart disease is. And the truth is, I care not just about preventing heart disease in a woman for 10 years from now, but for her entire lifetime. So when I think about when to use cholesterol medications, I really do try to um, sort of look at the patient that I have in front of me to help me understand, are there reasons that I should be putting her on a cholesterol medication, even if her 10-year risk is not particularly elevated? So this is an area of active debate um, among our um, colleagues right now, and we may expect to see some changes in guidelines in the coming years. Guidelines always trail a little bit um, with, I think, expert consensus, um, but generally I I find that I treat my patients who are in front of me and I use guidelines to help me think about um, who I should be treating. And then the other question was related to family history. Certainly, um, if an individual or if a patient has a family history of, of heart disease or high cholesterol, I'm going to be much more aggressive about treating their cholesterol. Um, and then I think the final question was, how do we think about if your total cholesterol levels are quite elevated, but actually that might be made up of a very good good cholesterol proportion like HDL and a low LDL cholesterol. That's actually pretty good. I think that what I really look at is trying to lower that bad cholesterol, the LDL value. And right now we do not have therapies actually to in that increase HDL that really translate to meaningful differences in heart outcomes. And so in general, I really focus on trying to lower the uh, bad cholesterol, the LDL, and if somebody has good HDL or good cholesterol, I think that's a great thing. And if that ultimately means that their total cholesterol is high because of their high proportion of HDL or their good cholesterol, I think that's, I, I, I say, good job, that that's a great, a great thing for my uh, women patients. Perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Emily. And for you, Darshan, uh, someone asked a little bit about osteopathic manipulative medicine as a complementary treatment and wondering, you know, a little bit about that and why you might not have included it. Oh, um, I, I, um, I mean, there's so much to talk about in complementary integrative therapy. So uh, obviously, um, osteopathic manipulative therapy is a, a discipline that is uh, taught to those that are trained as DOs, or doctors of osteopathy, which uh, you know in the United States have equivalent ranking or um, a cred a credentialed or licensed DO has the same privilege as a licensed MD uh, within the institutions. It's just um, in osteopathic medical training, there is a, sort of this, um, uh, they do learn this approach. Uh, it's a lost art, I think, for most osteopaths uh, who, and, um, uh, because often won't practice it. So, uh, so it, it is a, yeah, it, it is another type of manipulative approach that can be uh, probably most uh, uh, used in uh, neck pain and headache management, uh, along with sometimes low back or upper back, upper back pain, but maybe chronic back pain. But um, um, beyond that, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, so it was not a, it was not intentional. We had uh, for a short presentation. It was just I didn't have a chance to talk about it. Terrific. So it's nice that uh, people know that is another option. So a question for you, uh, Dr. Lau. This someone specifically asked about measuring visceral fat, um, and then there were other questions I think were also relevant and kind of combined with that, which is, you know, it's easy to say this is the target BMI. But, you know, it seems like women at midlife, they we all gain weight. Uh, and that seems pretty universal. Maybe, you know, any data on why women at midlife gain weight? And are there any particular interventions for midlife women that are helpful? So I'll go ahead and repeat the questions here for our um, members here at the Vincent Center. So the questions are relating to how do we measure? Um, oops, I'll go ahead and have us turn down the volume again. Um, but the question is related to what, um, how do we measure visceral fat? And are there any data that help guide us in terms of therapies for weight management through the midlife? So the first question is a fantastic question. 
we know that weight is different. We know subcutaneous fat versus visceral fat is very different with respect to heart health risk. Um, but we don't typically actually measure subcutaneous fat and visceral fat, at least in the clinical setting. The way that we measure this in research studies is through CAT scans, and we actually do specialized measurements. One proxy for abdominal uh, or visceral fat is what we call the waist circumference. Um, that gives us a little bit of a better sense of whether a woman has more visceral fat compared with subcutaneous fat than just weight alone. Um, but I think that may be changing over time as we have more research to better understand the differences in the types of fat that we actually carry. And then the next question was related to what uh, is the data that we, what are the data that we have about why women gain weight during midlife? This is an area of active investigation. We don't know exactly what it is. We suspect that um, decline in estrogen plays a role, but not, it does not answer the whole question. Um, we are interested in inflammation, which is why, what my study is about. Um, but I have found that uh, the new class of medications, GLP-1 agonists in particular, which were actually created for diabetes patients, have actually been shown to reduce weight, and they've been very effective in many of my patients who are um, in their midlife. So that's an area I think that we're going to see a lot more of. Um, right now, uh, we're starting to see even primary care doctors prescribe these therapies. They used to be really uh, relegated to the realm of weight medicine, um, but I think that they're going to be a medication that we're going to see in all of our practices very soon. Thanks so much. And uh, Darshan, a question for you. Uh, somebody asked about, you know, this, you mentioned a lot of really uh, kind of important and helpful therapies. How do we access them locally? I think most of our audience is Boston area. Yeah, I mean, most uh, most of the academic health centers do have a, uh, a center a resource that can um, help um, the patients uh, determine, uh, you know, how best to navigate the world of complementary integrative therapies. And so at Mass General, uh, we have the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine. There's certainly patients can uh, be seen by a physician initially to help uh, guide some of this decision making. And at the Brigham, there's the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine uh, as well. So uh, those are two places within our uh, system that uh, certainly uh, are sort of key, um, uh, I guess, uh, centers. But uh, in addition, uh, certainly the community affiliates, some of them have offered therapy. So many of them will offer therapies like acupuncture, massage therapy um, are seen across multiple uh, both clinics and centers across the, across the multiple centers here. It's a little bit harder and the private, I mean, there's a lot of obviously uh, when you go into private practice and, and such, it's a bit harder to navigate sometimes and, and there's just a lot out there. And so uh, certainly, again, these are questions that uh, we try to help patients when we see them in consultation in our practice to help them navigate some of their, I mean, there are just a lot of choices that patients will have. It's also, as I noted in my talk, to understand the costs associated with them, that sometimes, you know, seeing uh, if you're, say, for example, trying acupuncture, that is uh, one treatment may not be sufficient to understand if that's going to help your condition or not. You actually have to understand what the, at least based on the research, what was the number of treatments done, what frequency over what period of time. So those are the things that we would help uh, patients understand. Great, thank you. I think we have time for just one last question. And again, I'm so sorry if we couldn't get to everyone's questions. But um, Dr. Lau, uh, someone was saying, you know, we, we've heard there are some new guidelines for blood pressure that are a little stricter than the old ones. And also, how concerned should I be about this white coat hypertension? Is it real? Should I worry about it? All right, I'll go ahead and have us turn down the volume here and I'll repeat the question for our members at the Vincent Center. So the question is related to high blood pressure and the new guidelines uh, related to high blood pressure and how much should we be worried about white coat hypertension? Uh, fantastic question. We have begun to realize that high blood pressure is one of the most important risk factors for future risk of heart disease. And the new guidelines actually recommend that we lower blood pressure to less than 130 over 80. So that's a little bit different than what we had used to see, uh, where we were a little bit more lenient with blood pressures. Uh, we sort of permitted blood pressure, certainly in the 130s up to even 140s. And with respect to high, uh, white coat hypertension, the way I always talk to my patients is 
that certainly we know that white coat hypertension is a situational um, is related to the situation you might be in when you're coming to the doctor's office, you're a bit nervous, or you're driving down Storo Drive and you're a little stressed out, but your heart doesn't know that you're in the doctor's office or that you're on Storo Drive. It just sees the higher blood pressure. So I still think of white coat hypertension as something that we need to be mindful of. And occasionally, if it's very high, I, I even think about starting blood pressure medications. Now, I never take one blood pressure measurement and react to that. I typically ask my patients to do two week blood pressure diaries, take your blood pressure in the morning, every day, after you've taken your medications. And I like to see a general trend. And if I see that your general trend is that your blood pressure is really persistently above 130 over 80, that's when we start thinking about um, adding on some more blood pressure medications. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Emily. So uh, thanks to both of you for just a great Q&A session. Of course, a thanks to our uh, audience members for the, the really thoughtful questions. Uh, and at this point, I did want to draw our afternoon to a close. Um, thanks so much, all of you, for attending the seventh annual community conference of the Mass General Midlife Women's Health Center. Although it's great to see you all in person, thrilled that we could do this virtually this year. I think this format does really work well uh, for education. Um, we certainly encourage you all to visit our center's website, uh, the MGH, if you do MGH Midlife, uh, you'll come to our website where there will be videos from today's conference soon posted. And also you can look back and see videos from our prior community conferences. A lot of great topics have been covered over time. Uh, we certainly welcome your comments about the conference and suggestions for topics for 2023. So the email at which you registered, the MGH Midlife, uh, you can send us any messages at that email address and we will be uh, really happy to see you all back next year, and we will try to incorporate some of the topics you suggest. So thanks again, uh, and I hope everyone enjoys this really lovely fall evening. Take care, stay safe and well. Bye-bye.